Public is an innovative foundation that, that engages global change makers and mobilizes media, data, and technology for social impact around the world. Uh, the foundation has been around for 10 years um, and has worked with numerous global partners. We're happy to co-host this public square session today with CGCX and BGBF. We thank them for their support of sustainable development and the promotion of the sustainable development goals. I am fortunate quickly here to be able to pass the mic to our amazing moderator, Amir Dosal. Amir is the president and CEO of the Global Partnerships Forum, and he'll set the scene for the conversation and introduce our outstanding panelists. Amir, I will pass it on over to you. Take it away. Thank you. Thank you, Stephen. And good morning, good evening, everybody. A warm welcome to everyone. I, I want to start by thanking Sergio Fernandez de Cordova and you, Stephen, for putting together this amazing panel. I, as we all know, that the pandemic has actually impacted the lives of many of us. Uh, but the worst thing has been that about 70 million people have been impacted by it in such a way that they are living now in extreme poverty. Uh, you have a situation where the divide is growing. In the developing world, about 750 million children cannot go to school because they don't have access to the internet. They struggle uh, with classes and so on. And the bottom line is, we just cannot continue like this. We need to bridge that divide. We need to figure out how we can change the way things work and also help address the SDGs. And talking about the SDGs, next week, the UN is holding the high level political forum, which will talk about ways that public private partnerships can be utilized to accelerate progress. So today's session is about exactly that. How can we accelerate progress, but through the lens of innovation and entrepreneurship. And we have an amazing group of panelists, experts in their own right, who are doing great work to change the landscape for all of us. So I'm going to start by uh, introducing Chantaline Carpentier, who is the head of the New York office for UNTAD. Uh, what I propose to do is each of the panelists, we will invite them to say something about what they are doing and how innovation and entrepreneurship and it can make a difference, including the power of blockchain technologies and how that can actually help the UN as well change that approach. I, it, just by way of background, Chatelaine has been uh, in the UN system for a number of years. She's an expert in her field. She's actually an agronomist as well. She's an economist. She's, uh, she's very passionate about food issues as well. And the UN is hosting a food summit later this year. So she brings a huge amount of expertise. Uh, and UNCTAD, by the way, has been at the forefront of pushing the entrepreneurship agenda pushing the idea of uh, private sector investments. So Chatelaine, welcome and over to you. You're muted, I think. Yes, the, uh, the expression of this year, right? Thank you so much, Amir, and thank you, Public Foundation. It's a pleasure to be with you. Um, let me start, Amir, by, by reinforcing what you just said. Before the pandemic, 15% of the adult population when it was engaged in entrepreneurship activities on average. And entrepreneurship is an extremely important source of employment and li livelihood. But entrepreneurs and micro small enterprises were severely impacted by COVID-19 related lockdown. And I chose this background because we just celebrated on Monday the International Day of Micro Small Enterprises. And I think it's important that we keep them on top of our mind as we recover. Um, and that's why I was so uh, happy to be invited and speak with you today uh, on this issue. Um, so basically my, the micro small in, enterprises were hardly hit because they're re overrepresented in the service sector, vulnerable to lockdown and social distancing, um, as well as plagued with informality. But also they are overly um, creating um, job for women and youth where we've seen the most job lost. And by the way, ILO estimate a, a 
245 million gem equivalent lost um, over the 2020 period. Um, and so basically what that means is that the sector in general, um, the entrepreneurs and micro small enterprises have been really affected and they typically are not as resilient to shock as large company to have easier access to finance. Um, and, but however, on the other hand, they are inherently frugal and nimble. And many of them took this opportunity during the, the crisis to pivot and their business model and provide, for instance, provide, uh, protective equipment, uh, personal equipment during the COVID when we didn't have enough masks uh, or uh, respirators and also other essential goods during the pandemic, right? So what I'd like to do today, Amir, to get the discussion going is go over five cross, cross-cutting issues that I think um, are, need urgent attention if we want to recover from COVID-19 with a vibrant entrepreneurship ecosystem and resilient society. And these five are uh, first, of course, start with comprehensive and holistic policies that are needed to promote entrepreneurship development and to optimize its impact on Agenda 2030 based on the lessons that we've just learned. And we know that we will need to provide technical assistance both to government and to entrepreneur, to government to develop the science, technology, innovation, entrepreneurship space and ecosystem at the country level. Um, and, and, for, and, at the, and for that, UNCTAD has developed the entrepreneurship policy framework um, that take a very systemic approach to, to entrepreneurship uh, with six pillars, and now we're working, Amir, in developing a, a revising that, that framework that's been used in Tanzania, Ethiopia, Gambia, Cameroon, Nigeria, uh, the, the, the Dominican Republic, Ecuador, Brazil, among others. Um, and we want to add a seventh pillar, which is market access, as you can imagine with the COVID-19 major issue as everything goes online. Um, but, you know, we're, we've implemented this entrepreneurship policy framework in so many countries, but we have 15 outstanding requests from developing countries. We just don't have the money to be able to, to uh, help all the countries that have asked us. And of course, we've adapted that uh, framework to youth entrepreneurship and migrant and refugees entrepreneurship. And now we're hoping to be able to partner with, with colleagues and do one dedicated to women entrepreneurship. The second one after policy that uh, is, is needed is digitalization. We've all seen the acceleration of digitalization of the economy uh, through this, this crisis. And, um, and, and it has helped some entrepreneurs absorb the shock um, and, and help update their business model and, and access new uh, market and financing scheme. But I think people sometimes convolute, and I, I look forward to Ursula speak on this, but they convolute two things. One is the, the first digital revolution, the Web 2.0 technology, which is highly interactive, standardized digital technologies used for digitalized you know, education, and as we went online for education and telehealth and, and all these things, right? Uh, but the second one, the, te the second technological wave is highly data-driven and is involved AI, uh, big data analytics, robotics, IoT, blockchain, and other frontier technologies, right, which you mentioned. And those are associated with Industry 4.0. And this wave is more at the beginning stage. Um, and these frontier technology really can help us achieve SDG3 um, it through, you know, tracking diseases and early warning system and, and monitor crop and drought. And so they're very important. But half the world population are not connected to the internet. Or, and, and have been locked out of teleworking, education, and e-commerce boom that we've just seen. But on, as importantly, what we find, Amir, in our technology and innovation report is that it's not enough to have the infrastructure. You need to have the skills to transform this data and this information and these technology into value-added product and services. And a lot of our entrepreneurs and micro small enterprises have not been skilled to do that. And it's important that we do that through five A's, availabilities, affordability, awareness, accessibility, and ability for effective use and creating value out of them. The third point is entrepreneurship mindset. We basically need to have, um, starting elementary school, <laughs> starting to have an entrepreneurship mindset um, because it, 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 I, I'm a firm believer and I know Amir you are as well. Entrepreneur will be the one that make us achieve the SDGs if we achieve them. But we need to empower more entrepreneurs to be able to capture the business opportunities associated with the SDGs. 
And right now, there's not enough awareness about them. There's not enough skills of the, the skill set that are necessary for the entrepreneur. entrepreneur. And, and the, our business school do not prepare our entrepreneur to actually capture the business opportunity that will be in, the, in emerging markets. 70, 84% of the case studies in our business schools right now are dedicated to develop economies. That's not where the market grow is, and that's not where people need innovation in business model to have access to affordable electricity and sanitation and water and education and all these other SDGs that we have. So we need a reform of our business school curriculum, and we need to start educating um, uh, our entrepreneur earlier. UNCTAD does its part. We have an unprotect capacity building program, which is a behavioral uh, Harvard program adapted to developing countries that we've now rolled out, helped countries develop in 43 of these countries, and that have trained half a million entrepreneurs around the world and creating thousands of jobs. But we need to do much more. Fourth point, data collection. We cannot measure the impact right now of entrepreneurship or, or innovation or of MSMEs because we just don't have the data, and especially when you talk about the impact that they can have on SDGs and on our society. And this data, of course, need to be disaggregated by gender, age, religion, and other groups, as well as regional. Finally, fifth point, we need stronger coordination at all level. We need a whole of government approach. It's not enough to have the entrepreneurship policies in place. We need to have the science, technology, innovation policies that are right. We need the industrial policies that are right. We need the trade and investment and infrastructure policies and investment that are all aligned so that we can have a quickly changing uh, a systems change so we can achieve the SDGs through our entrepreneur and micro small enterprises. I'll stop here, Amir, and hoping that that's going to help create some discussion. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you. This is very, very inspiring. In fact, I, I, whilst you were saying all these things, I was thinking that we need to capture all this information and make it available to the general public because there's a wealth of information, some great ideas, uh, how to move forward. And I was wondering, actually, you, you, you talked about policies. Uh, I, I read somewhere that uh, from World, uh, World Economic Forum report that about 66% of the economy is reliant on SMEs uh, because they're the engine of growth around the world. And, and you're so right that the, these five areas you mentioned are key that we need to be thinking about them in such a way that it'll make a difference to the quality of lives of those people, they get the option to do things. So what would you say are the kinds of policies and measures that are needed? Uh, you mentioned the digital gap. How can we avoid widening of that gap? Yeah, and it's very important. All this COVID has done is, is basically exacerbate existing inequalities that we already had, right? And so those that didn't have access to uh, connectivity before, they felt it even more because they, they, the young girl in the, in the rural household without connectivity couldn't have education. And if there was only one computer in the household, it's the boy that would get it and not the girl. And so we're about to lose a generation of girls um, and, and, and youth around the world. So what do we need? We need infrastructure, which I'll let Ursula which I talk about because that's her area and expertise. But what I would like to talk about is the skills. And so it's not enough, as I mentioned, to have the infrastructure. I can have connectivity. What we found in our technology innovation report is that even in Europe, the, the most use of the connectivity and these new technologies is mostly for social media and, and, and other um, a pleasurable thing and not for creating value and, and business model uh, and innovation. And so that's the one problem that we have. And this is not the developing countries versus the developed world. This is about, on the one end, US and China and the rest of the world. US and China have managed to create value out of these technologies. The rest of the world is catching up. We need a, a worldwide consultation on this to move forward. The second that I'm concerned about, Amir, is just as we're going through a increased importance of digitalization and connectivity, the official development aid going to science and technology innovation to developing countries went down by 3.6% over the last year. And ODA is actually, the ODA con concessional term is going down. We, and if you look at the least developed countries, 
the amount of money for their science, technology, innovation went down almost 30%. Are we really expecting to have a world that will be equal if we keep in that trend? We need to reverse those, these trends. And, and we need to ensure, and I would, I would go even further again, Already women before the pandemic owned about 5% of the world's asset. We need to build telecom capacity. We need to build that infrastructure. Why don't we set our goal to ourselves that 50% of this asset needs to be owned by women? That would really make a systems change. That will really change this, this, this pattern of women not owning the asset and being at the table. Uh, same with the youth. Why don't we arrange to have models where youth can be the one that own these assets? Same with sustainable agriculture, renewable energy infrastructure, and, and space for that matter. But then we also need right now to invest in, in early hmm. education on entrepreneurship mindset. Great. Right. I, I have to tell you, that I can think of so many other things that I would like to ask, and I, I want to give uh, our other panelists a bit of a chance, but of I, you'll give me an opportunity to come back to you because the ideas of how MSMEs uh, have impacted or can impact the uh, success of the SDGs, what's happened with COVID-19 and so on. So please bear with me. I, I'll be back with you shortly. I, and I'd like to now invite Ben, Ben Menon, uh, you're a veteran uh, of the tech industry. You've created several disruptive technologies, uh, technology companies, and what I would call is a serial entrepreneur. And you've been recognized as such, as a leading entrepreneur, entrepreneur of the year, so many different awards. And what we've watched is how you're passionate about the cliche or the concept of doing well and doing good. And sure. uh, commitment to the SDG. So I'd like to invite you to share some background of what you do and what's the secret of your success. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. And uh, uh, thanks Public Foundation for giving us an opportunity to share our thoughts. So we have our distinguished speakers all experienced in their own way, but the kind of experience or the background which I'm coming from is purely a technopreneurship, which we consider as like the, the frontier these days. And in the kind of activities which we are doing for the last uh, five to six years is purely on blockchain. So I would I would like to focus my you know my comments or my thought process around blockchain because that's where we are breathing right now. But however, you know I, I really appreciate uh, the the experience and the knowledge which are uh, shared by the distinguished speakers. And you know I would like to add a little bit point on how blockchain technology, one of the frontier technologies, can add into this whole thing and how we are contributing towards SDGs. Right. So. So I, personally, I've been like driven by passion since since uh, came from a humble background, uh, and 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 kept some of these basic core principles like nothing is impossible and don't give up kind of attitude to reach me where I am today. But at the same time, uh, we don't really f focus on make creating wealth or creating success. It is actually a byproduct. What we are trying to do is trying to create some sort of a platform which is actually uh, applicable to the community, somewhere it is creating impact. And if that can be created from technology, primarily innovation or blockchain or some of these kind of aspects, which I will be sharing at a later stage, uh, that automatically, uh, you know, creating a lot of impact around. And that is how I feel that we, uh, technology, uh, a technocrat or a technology industry will be contributing towards SDG on all the 17 codes. Now, thank you. Ju just, yeah. yeah, so sorry. Yeah, go ahead. Please, please. Yes. Yeah, so we all come from, you know, that, that kind of like, how can we create more value for the people around and how can we create impact? And on a personal level, we talk about mudita, right? It, it's a Buddhism word, which gives that, you know, uh, when you see other people happy, you feel happy. And that, that's a kind of, an, you know, uh, 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 more about what we are rolling out to uh, the community or the technology which we develop or the innovation which we do or the activities which we are doing. And that keeps us, you know, growing on a personal level. And when that micro goes into macro level, that's actually where the entrepreneurship and creating impact comes into and applicable to SDGs. Right. And, 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 you know, 
Chantelin rightly pointed out that ODA, which is Overseas Development Assistance, has been declining, sadly. Actually. In other words, the funds which developed countries give to the poorer countries. Uh, in fact, UNCTAD, when the SDGs were first formulated, UNCTAD calculated that we need $2.4 trillion worth of investment every year, every year. And that doesn't come from governments. That won't come from large conglomerates. It'll come from the private sector, civil society, SMEs, et cetera. So I'd like to get your thoughts. And if, by the way, I just want to add that the Secretary General of the United Nations has made innovation and entrepreneurship an important component of that, engaging young people. And again, we talked about, uh, Chantelin mentioned about the whole of government approach, whole of society approach, stronger collaboration. I'd like your thoughts in terms of how you see the private sector, especially through innovation and entrepreneurship, playing a role to address the SDGs. Because you, you, in the past, you've talked about some creative uh, approaches of uh, making sure the SDGs are not forgotten. So, yeah. All right. so th that's great. Uh, so it's a, it's a good question. So basically, in our ecosystem, we are trying to create an ecosystem within the last five to six years, which starts from a, a blockchain-based crypto exchange. Then we have a blockchain-based Bitcoin fund. Then we have a DeFi platform. Then we are trying to create all this together to create something which is creating value for the community. So in this whole thing, right, uh, what happens is blockchain, uh, so just to share with you, uh, with the, which uh, Chandel was talking about web 2.0, right? So we have seen web 1.0, the bulletin boards, the classified ads, then web 2.0, which is creating value for like the e-commerce services, et cetera. So what we are trying to create in the blockchain world, we call it as web 3.0. What we are trying to do is every minute you spend in this platform, you are going to get, you know, remunerated for that. And that is depending on your skills. And if that remuneration can be deployed through a blockchain infrastructure, that is even better. So let's, let me just give you a classic example, right? We all have our free emails with multiple service providers, right? And most of them gives you 25, 50 gigabytes of you know, free spaces. But do we know that, you know, because they are providing one email space of 25 gig to us, they are making 17, $20,000 in a year. Because what they're trying to do is monetizing the information or the insights which we have through that providing the free service. And, and a corporate is becoming richer out of, out of my data or my insights. And what blockchain or Web 3.0 trying to do is getting this data and distributing the wealth back to the user. That means that the blockchain as a democratic way of deploying the technology or deploying the data insights and giving you the value back to you you because it's your information and this is this is the kind of trend which we are rolling out so you know amir you, you very well remember a couple of years back we presented uh, bamboo as a insurance for everyone project right yes. so that's exactly what we are trying to do so you as a uh, you as a user uh, you are providing your data insights about your health, what you are doing with your, you know, the lifestyle, etc. Taking that and you have been incentivized because of your providing that insight. And that can contribute towards your policy premium payments or mm -hmm. your other, you know, anything about the healthcare ecosystem. So what we are trying to do is trying to create an ecosystem which is really going to com remunerate you for what you are or your in personal insights or your personal data of course without compromising compromising any of the you know sensitive information so this is the kind of platform which blockchain can provide and that is we that's what we consider as web 3.0 and so cgcx being one of our you know the core business uh, entity which is right now uh, thankfully today is the big day where we have actually just uh, signed the uh, uh, the uh, the uh, uh, definitive documents to merge with a US, a US listed company, MJWL. And uh, yeah, and, and we are sure that we'll be able to, you know, expand much further from this space. So CG6 being a platform, we are trying to create that blockchain uh, platforms for 
whether it is healthcare, whether it is education, whether it is any other kind of services which can come into our platform and can create these kind of services around. Well, this so, is exciting about CGCX. Uh, yes. Especially when you talk about health and education, um, I, I can visualize that uh, this could touch a number of the SDGs. I, I, yes. Could you, you elaborate a little bit on that? Okay, so when we are talking about uh, insurance, it's, it's, uh, it's directly, uh, you know, touching the three and seven and 17. Then we are talking about education, it's touching the education. So overall, when we are talking about CG6 as a blockchain platform, it is actually almost going to provide services to pretty much all the SDG goals, one to 17, in different forms, shapes, and sizes. And, and of course, goal 17, you'll thread everything together. That's the goal for partnership. Yeah. That's right. That's right. So, I, it, it, of course, I'm really excited to hear this, and it, I, I can see that Ursula will be able to add a, a real value to the issue of these disruptive technologies, how telecom impacts the uh, yes ecosystem, and so on. So, before I move to Ursula, I just want to ask you a final question. Sure. What advice would you give the international community uh, in, in terms of how to leverage these? business ecosystems of disruptive technologies. You're constantly evolving into uh, different technologies, but also I uh, appreciate what you're looking at is how to make a difference as well, how to have a societal impact. Right, so see, uh, now, now we moved into a, a, a listed reporting kind of an entity. So we know how, how important is the bottom line for a corporate for, right? But what we can do is, right? The part of cash generating from the funds or the businesses, should be looking towards investing into impact investments. And that invest in, in, investment will generate returns so that your balance sheet or your profitability is, is in turn, you know, without, without having an impact. But at the same time, that is going to create a lot of impact on the other side to the community. So I would suggest, right, you know, instead of, you know, everyone has the CSR kind of a, 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 a goal in the, you know, within your organization. So try to, you know, divert that energy towards uh, investing into impact investments, which automatically creating impact while you are making money as well. So you're achieving both the goals. And I'm sure that the 2.4 trillion we are talking about, which is going, you know, where, where these private companies are going to get. Most of, most of it, if, if we decide that all the private companies or the public companies decide to work on that model that, you know, contributing certain percentage of their cash reserves into impact investment, probably we'll be able to achieve some numbers like that. That's very good advice. Thank you. Appreciate that very much. And I think this is a nice segue into uh, my good friend, Ursula Weinhoven. Ursula is the uh, director of the Office for the International Telecommunication Union here in New York. And yeah. she's had uh, a number of years experience at the UN Global Compact. And Ursula has always operated on the business of how can innovation entrepreneurship really change the direction of the way we're working. Ursula, a uh, warm welcome to you. And why don't you give us a, a summary and then maybe I can ask you a couple of questions as well. Thank you, welcome. Thank you so much, Amir. And uh, thanks also to Public Foundation for having me and ITU part of today's fantastic discussion. Um, for anyone who might not know, ITU is a specialized agency of the United Nations for Information and Communication Technologies. And we allocate global radio spectrum and satellite orbits, develop technical standards that ensure that networks and technologies seamlessly interconnect, as well as striving to improve access to ICTs to underserved communities worldwide. As has already been mentioned in this session, uh, almost half of the world's population is still not connected to the internet. And even many of those who are connected are not able to benefit from its full potential because of issues like lack of affordability, lack of digital skills, and lack of relevant local content. ITU's mission is to connect all the world's people wherever they live and whatever their means. And universal affordable digital connectivity is the vital catalyst that can dramatically change the global development picture and propel us forward in the efforts to reach the 17 SDGs. And this is all the more important, of course, because of 
COVID. We were off track on the SDGs before COVID. Uh, and now it's even more vital that we use um, all these means, um, including innovation and entrepreneurship to get on track. It's COVID among other things, of course, demonstrated just how vital, reliable and affordable internet has become to virtually all aspects of our lives and underscored the urgency of finishing the job of getting everyone meaningfully connected. But business as usual is not gonna get us there. The lack of access to or the failure to use disruptive digital technologies has resulted in exacerbating the digital divide in recent years and innovation and entrepreneurship are thus more critical than ever. Innovation actually features prominently in what the ITU Secretary General calls the four eyes to close the gap. Infrastructure, which was already mentioned, investment, innovation, and inclusiveness. ICT development, including frontier technologies, 5G and others, and bringing their benefits to all will be absolutely essential to achieving the SDGs and to building back better. And it needs new policies as well for the digital economy, policies that can accelerate inclusive connectivity access and use. So specifically regarding innovation and entrepreneurship, ITU supports and promotes these in a range of ways. For example, through standardization, ITU sets global standards that enable businesses and technologies to communicate with each other easily. Standards that also drive competitiveness, not just for individuals, individual businesses, but throughout the global economy by fostering efficiency, effectiveness, responsiveness, and innovation. They also enable new technologies, for example, 5G technologies, which have made possible the latest generation of smart devices, smart cities, and even self-driving vehicles, as well as allowed for solutions to be quickly developed in the COVID environment, such as remote healthcare and, and, and education, et cetera. So one silver lining of COVID, I think, has actually been that old adage about necessity being the mother of invention. So I think we've seen quite a bit of innovation during this, this period as well using um, technologies. So in the area of ICT development, ITU fosters growth and global connectivity, working with international partners to develop skills and infrastructure that enable developing countries to digitally transform, which in itself presents an opportunity for small businesses and communities to take advantage of these new skills and capabilities in the creation of businesses and projects. Among other things, we host competitions and incubators, such as the ITU Smart Incubator, uh, for supporting SMEs and startups using frontier technologies in particular. There's more information at incubator.itu.int for small companies to elevate their success and to promote entrepreneurship in tech, particularly those that are trying to make the world a better place. ITU is also targeting the shortfall of digital skills that small businesses need, fostering technical literacy including through digital transformation centers, the digital skills toolkit, and more generally through academy.itu.int. We also support member states and innovators with policies, programs, resources, and know-how for addressing systemic issues hindering digital transformation. So that's my little introduction, Amir. Uh, this is unbelievable. In fact, I was just thinking, what was the web link you said about uh, uh, incubation, the incubator.int? Yes, incubator.itu.int is our uh, incub smart incubator specifically for frontier tech entrepreneurs. I, amazing, actually. I, I, you, you, and again, I'm beginning to think that there's so, uh, so much wealth of information by you, Vin, and uh, Chatelaine, that we must find a way to capture this and people can read it later on as well. Uh, I, I'm very interested to hear that. We, we, I want to go back to the issue of MSME. As you know, that uh, we've just had the uh, UN Micro, Small, and Medium-Sized Enterprises Day, just on the 27th of June. And I want to get your views, in, especially since ITU has been in the forefront of frontier technologies, uh, AI, and various other initiatives. How, how do you see the role of MSMEs in the innovation and entrepreneurship landscape to advance the SDGs. And maybe can I add one other uh, supplementary to this? There are issues like artificial intelligence, IoT, as you mentioned, mobile communication. How does that fit in so that it is 
fairly distributed and widely distributed, especially to those who do not have proper access. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. I'll speak, speak specifically about the role of tech MSMEs, um, which is absolutely vital when you're talking about innovation and, and entrepreneurship to advance the, the SDGs. So as we know, MSMEs, while they may be small in size, they have many big innovative ideas and that they offer something that big tech companies cannot. They're more dynamic as they often don't have the same corporate bureaucracy. And they're also often closer and more in touch with local communities and the needs of their, of their customers. So they can come up with something really new and innovative. And that's one of the things which I think is so exciting about a lot of these frontier technologies that they, they, that they can actually be accessible so that there, there is a space for MSMEs and they have really been playing an absolutely vital role in innovation. So it's absolutely critical that the ecosystem um, be there um, to, support, to support them. So um, we're actually seeing tech MSMEs developing and working with these new technologies are driving industry-wide innovation. And they're often the source of innovative ICT enabled solutions that are having a long lasting impact, not only nationally or regionally, but also globally. And just one example of that is around, for instance, space technologies, but all the other areas of tech that you mentioned, Amir, we're also seeing really exciting um, innovation. And I think we're increasingly seeing, for instance, venture capitalists recognizing this. So just as the example of, of space technologies, for instance, they have an increased interest in this area and in funding space related startups with $4.5 billion being invested in growing space businesses just in the first quarter of this of this year. So there's a, a lot of a lot of potential, um, a lot of potential there. And I would also just add, you know, echoing Chanteline on this, that we know that MSMEs are absolutely critical in terms of job creation. Tech MSMEs are also playing a key role in helping to upskill the workforce for the you know, fourth industrial revolution. So they're playing a really critical role there. And tech, of course, is globally exportable. So that means that innovations can be shared with other customers and companies around the world, especially if it's online. So there's huge potential for the adaption of existing MSMEs into tech businesses. And IT works directly on this um, in our digital innovation ecosystems project, which enables small businesses to make mm. the most of resources that are available and encourages member states to provide the policies and infrastructure to enable digital growth for small businesses. But there's still so much work to be done, of course, on this. Only 44 countries currently have startup policies to help launch tech businesses. So our goal is that every member country to have some kind of such policy in place um, by um, by 2030. Um, and then just briefly on your, your second question, um, which I believe was around how to foster innovation to ensure that fields like AI and blockchain and internet of things and mobile are widely and fairly distributed. Um, well, a, a critical piece, and this harks back to what I was saying a little earlier, it's absolutely vital that everybody have access to the internet, reliable, and affordable access to the internet. So they can take advantage of these technologies and innovate with these technologies. And 5G technologies will play a particularly critical role in this, in this expansion. And then the education piece, which Chantelin mentioned is also absolutely vital. We need to build capacity um, widely um, on these, with these skills in these, in these areas. And I think one of the things that's so exciting about these frontier tech technologies is that they you know haven't been around a long time so you know it's possible it's still possible for for people to um, upskill and get in and for tech and msmes to have a really big impact and come up with a big idea um, you know notwithstanding that they're that they're small so i would just finish by saying that the fairness piece is absolutely critical and the unfortunately you know that can be very expensive just with their computer systems, sensors, et cetera. Uh, and so it's absolutely vital that there be um, access to funding um, to support these, um, these entrepreneurs and the innovation that they're, they're coming up with. And just the potential is enormous and we need them so vitally, particularly after COVID, if we're gonna be able to achieve the SDGs and leverage to the max frontier tech for the SDGs.
thank you. That, in fact, it comes down to a very interesting scenario where the SMEs and, and in fact MSMEs, MSMEs sometimes struggle, struggle with digital technology. So what would you say are the challenges they face actually and, and how, how, what's your recommendation to overcome these challenges? Yeah, there's, 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 definitely, <laughs> there's de sorry, there's definitely um, some challenges and, but you know, there are also, there are also solutions if, you know, if we put the attention and, and, and mind set to it. Some of the challenges relate to lack of technical know-how and resources and coordination among the key stakeholders and policymakers. And these do create challenges um, for digital entrepreneurship that, you know, as I mentioned, digital technologies, they can, on the cutting edge can be expensive. And so it's really critical, for instance, that um, innovators can get access to, um, for instance, micro loans or grants to support the developments that are benefiting a community. And at the ITU GSR 21 summit, it identified financing of such innovations as a key funding priority, as well as making sure that funding possibilities are available fairly as well to, to women entrepreneurs and, and not just male entrepreneurs, and making sure that the funding sources are, are, are widely known. There's also can be a skills gap, um, the challenge of actually finding employees who, who have the skills. And so we need to definitely do more. Um, you know, IT is one of the organizations working on digital capacity building. And I mentioned some of the initiatives a little earlier, um, but that digital literacy is absolutely critical. The infrastructure is another, another challenge. Um, you know, global internet access is improving, but we also have those, those issues around affordability that I mentioned before. And so having that affordable access to the internet is absolutely critical, as I you know, mentioned a little while before. And then um, I'll also just mention that cooperation between and within organizations is also absolutely vital to support, uh, you know, tech entrepreneurs, including in, in developing countries. There's been really exciting innovations that have come and are coming from people from different fields as well, um, coming together, bringing different skills and experiences, you know, across different locations. And so one example of, of this, which I'll just mention, which is really exciting, is the UNICEF ITU Initiative GIGA, which is a global initiative to connect every school to the internet and every young person to information, opportunity and choice. And it recognizes that closing the digital divide will require global cooperation, leadership and innovation in finance and technology. So among other things, we really need these um, MSMEs, these, these tech entrepreneurs, wherever they may be, um, we need, they may be small, but we need their big ideas if we're going to be able to achieve the SDGs. Great, thank you, thank you. So <clears throat> I know we could continue this conversation with uh, all three of you, Ishii. Uh, but I also say there's uh, a rich exchange going on in the chat room here and some new ideas are coming up and some, uh, some suggestions as well about blockchain technologies, etc. Uh, I, I want to uh, start by asking some questions uh, from what the audience or the attendees are asking. So here's one question which uh, I can see. These last few years have seen a multitude of SDG blockchain projects as POCs. What we need to do is provide systems that can assist in scaling the impact projects. Uh, I know uh, Vain and Ursula and Chanteline, all of you are working on ways to share use cases and find ways to extrapolate them widely and so that they can be replicated. So who would like to tackle this question? Vain, would you like to say something? Uh, okay, yeah. Can you uh, can you hear me? Yes, absolutely. Okay, okay. Thanks. So basically, uh, in terms of what we have tried to do, uh, something around the SDGs, achieving the uh, you know the uh, the block blockchain objectives by achieving whatever the SDG specified goals are. So what we have done, like in the past couple of years, like we have been actually working on the project and we brought it back to the you know during our unga we try to create some sort of a, you know awareness of our projects across where there are a lot of state members were interested for us to bring in you know to their own uh, their own states and of course uh, 
COVID really, you know, change our world around. But otherwise, we would be like, you know, pitching that back to uh, and trying to create the, you know, the UN states, how, how they can actually help us to bring in these kind of technologies to their member states. So I think that's that's a way which to go with. And I'm sure Public Foundation is playing um, a vital role in such initiatives as well. Yes, indeed. I, and I just want to go back to uh, what I said earlier on. Sergio is the classic model of an innovator and an entrepreneur. And he's yeah. doing work to engage other people, people like yourselves and Ursula, Chantelin, et cetera. <clears throat> That's right. Uh, Ursula, a question for you. When it comes to these blockchain projects or other related, you, you talked about AI, um, AI can do, it can be very helpful in the health sector, education sector, et cetera. And IoT can impact, positively impact our everyday lives. How, how do you see within the UN system trying to scale it? And you mentioned several things which ITU is doing to help small and medium-sized enterprises. Okay. Yeah, the scaling piece is absolutely critical because there definitely are, there's lots of good ideas and, um, you know, some really successful projects out there and scaling it is critical. And one big piece for scaling is, of course, about the investment. You know, there's, there's um, the, the technologies, they, they are becoming cheaper, which is really critical and they are becoming more accessible, but we need them yesterday. So a critical piece of this is really making the investments recognizing the catalytic role that they play, particularly in the hands of you know, entrepreneurs in developing countries close to the challenges with you know, fantastic ideas. We need to have the investment to you know, realize, realize those. I mean, within the UN system, I think it's really important to mention the excellent work of the roadmap for digital cooperation and how that has highlighted a number of different areas and has, I think, had a tremendous impact in bringing a lot of different stakeholders together, both within the UN and outside the UN, to work on the variety of different streams, um, including issues like connectivity and capacity building. You know, two of the issues that have come up in this in this context. But there's a, you know a number of other streams there, and I think it provides, you know, a, true to its name, a wonderful roadmap. Um, that is really very helpful in terms of you know what is needed and there's some really exciting actions and um, initiatives that are coming out of that. Right. It, and by the way, th it, thank you. I, I just saw there is an earlier question about the need for regulation. Uh, the question was we also need regulations on innovation to mitigate unintended consequences. Now, I know the UN is not able to just issue regulations just like that, it can issue guidelines and so on. It can provide an enabling platform for, for these kinds of things to not happen, uh, some of the negative impacts. How, how, what is the state of play within the UN system in terms of guidance or innovation or regulations? I'm gonna uh, leave it for Ursula. <laughs> oh, for me. Okay, I was just about to ask Amir. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I mean, I think I would I would come back to the to the roadmap. I think specifically, um, I mean, I think the question of regulation in specific states is it really a question for those states? But it's definitely a, you know a topic hot on the on the agenda. Uh, I think one of the key principles is really about uh, how important it is that technologies be at the service of people and not people being at the service of technologies. And so there are um, there are there is a really important work being done, including in the area of AI, for instance, with the, a group um, under the um, high level committee for programs um, on AI, and it's really bringing in all these different dimensions across the UN, looking at issues from ethics to human rights, etc., and you know looking at what are the best good practices and best practices and you know how can one learn from them and how can those practices be shared across across countries so i i think it's it's still fairly early stage in terms of you know what the un is you know un agencies are, are recommending on this front but very much rec recognized as absolutely critical great thank you thank you and by the way i just saw a very interesting question which uh, uh, i will ask vin on this one uh, when the question is, can you please suggest a sustainable model of rural MSME 
for the local economic development in India, uh, especially through emerging technologies like blockchain, and other frontier technologies. Yeah. See, see, uh, especially when we are talking about India, right? I come from a background of uh, the in Indian demographics. So, so the strength is where, uh, you know, the mass population and the number of users, uh, et cetera. And that is where we can actually capitalize. So a technology like blockchain, when we start deploying into MSMEs, literally, for example, now I, I would say that I'm, I'm a, a small uh, SME with five, five employees, right? I don't have big budget for, or bu big resources for taking care of my technology requirements. But if I'm able to get a, a, a blockchain-based platform, whenever I'm contributing my insights to that platform, I'm getting incentivized. So I'm not actually incurring any capex or opex for running that kind of a technology. But at the same time, I'm fully in technology. So this is the kind of deployments, whether it is individual level or institutional level, we can start deploying. And that is the beauty of Web 3.0 or blockchain. Hmm. Very, very interesting. And so what you're saying is that figure out ways of using the power of new technologies, frontier technologies uh, in your everyday lives. And that can actually help you do well and do good in the process. That's right. Um, and yeah, could I just add briefly on that, what, since the issue sure. of, of rural areas and populations came up, I think it's it's so vital and, and also exciting to see the developments that are happening with uses of frontier tech for agriculture. And yeah. as that becomes cheaper, I think that's, you know, really important that when we face challenges like climate change, et cetera, that we, you know, these technologies and their incredible potential um, also be, be in the hands of you know farmers um, and that they can actually use it to to you know help improve their um, their livelihoods and etc. I'm so glad you mentioned that because I, I briefly touched on the UN Food Systems Summit, which is coming up in September, uh, and that the whole issue about that summit is how can you improve supply chain? How can you improve systems? How can you help farmers? Uh, sow the crops, uh, uh, till the land, distribute to market, get it in time so that there's reduced food wastage. Uh, according to many economists, uh, agronomists, they say it's not food shortage, it's just the lack of efficiency in the supply chain and the delivery system. So uh, very important that you mentioned that. Thank you. Um, we're, we're now, we've got six minutes left. And I just want to uh, go back and ask both of you to summarize in terms of what you see is the future for innovation and entrepreneurship. And is there a takeaway for our audience where they can feel that they can use some of your ideas and replicate them? And you can even, if you have some uh, creative suggestions, please feel free to do so. So how about if I start with Ursula? Yes, sorry, I had to unmute myself. Um, yeah, I think a, a really vital takeaway is how critical it is to finish that job of getting everyone connected. There's so much potential like we've been talking about for the use of these frontier technologies across literally every SDG, but we aren't there yet. Not only do we have half the world not yet connected, there's so many people who are connected who just can't yet make the full potential use. So we really need to to get on that so that we can benefit from tech and that everybody can benefit. Right, right, good, good, thank you. And Vin? Uh, yeah, so for me, I have a very different uh, take from this, right? Uh, so I would say that uh, uh, what we have seen in 80s and 90s talking about internet is what exactly what we are seeing about blockchain right now. And I'm, I'm a strong advocate of blockchain and I've been like breathing, living in blockchain for the last five, six years. I would say that internet, uh, blockchain is going to be the next internet. So working around the blockchain, trying to understand the power of blockchain and trying to create value-based systems around blockchain, which automatically creates impact and 
mostly it will be achieving pretty much all the SDGs, you know, what we are talking about. So, uh, yeah, so don't ignore this part of the frontier technology and, and try to, you know, try to accept and get into as much as possible in whatever levels you can towards blockchain as a technology. But of course, all the other things like Bitcoins and the cryptocurrencies, everything is on top of it. But blockchain is where the technology is and that's going to be the next internet and let's not lose out that. So, uh, even you mentioned about CGCS. Yeah. You mentioned about your insurance business. Yeah. Can you tell us a little bit of how this uh, entire landscape can be uh, utilized and put to service for the SDGs for doing good, blockchain related, but also uh, it might inspire other people in this process. Right. See, uh, so when we are talking about blockchain, the key is the economics around blockchain. We call it as tokenomics or whatever it is, right? So when you have that economics around blockchain, we have to realize that into in terms of fiat or US dollar or any of these, you know, in, you know, the currencies around, right? Which can be useful to anyone. So a financial system, a platform like CG6 is mandatory. So there are multiple other platforms. Yeah, we are not, but yeah. So we are trying to be regulated. We are trying to be insured. We, are, we want to make sure that the people who are coming into our platform are protected. All this part, uh, we have been, you know, working on it for the last uh, many years, right? And on top of that, now we are moving into US market with, uh, you know, uh, publicly listing in the NASDAQ OTC, uh, OTC entity. So we are just trying to, you know, uh, expand our business globally from the Southeast Asian perspective. But this, so the exchange business for us is the economy of blockchain. So yeah. any projects what we are doing, even when we are talking about giving healthcare or insurance for free or for, you know, uh, providing insurance using blockchain as a technology. So there is an element of financial you know, uh, transactions or economics around that. And that has to be done in a platform like CGCX. And that, that's you. where this, so that's, that's like the horizontal layer cutting across every industry. Great. And I want to uh, uh, congratulate you and- uh, for, for the, Thank you. Thank you so point. much for that. Uh, may this continue to grow exponentially so that uh, the SDG recipients are also the beneficiaries of this process. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much. Uh, and I'm delighted to see my good friend Chatelaine Carpentier back from her meeting at Secretary General's office. Uh, Chatelaine, thank you. you. It's perfect timing. I'd like you to summarize in terms of your ideas, your vision of using the power of innovation and entrepreneurship to accelerate the SDGs with, with something which can be inspiring for our audience so that they can also replicate it. That's a big question. <laughs> uh, you're on mute. There we go. Got Great. It. Thank okay, you. thank you so much. And really apologies, I had to go. Um, and good to see you, Ursula, good friend. And uh, nice meeting you, Vin. So basically, I think, Amir, I'll make it very simple. Um, entrepreneurs and innovation is the only way. Entrepreneurship and innovation is the only way we're going to achieve the SDG by 2030. We're running out of money. Um, we already had a gap of 2.5 trillion. Now we're at 4.5 trillion a year to achieve the SDGs. Um, and true frugal innovation, bottom up, pro poor approach, we can actually achieve the SDGs we, and through appropriate technology. But for that, we need to empower entrepreneurs and micro small enterprises first to understand the business opportunities associated with the SDGs. We remember that Paul Pullman estimated at $13 trillion. So follow the money. <laughs> Second is ensuring that uh, our business schools are actually <laughs> having the right curriculum to prepare entrepreneur. And three is the UN system coming together with our partners from outside to ensure that we steer innovation towards the SDGs. Increasingly, we're steering investment policy, trade policies towards achieving the SDGs. There's no reason why we can't steer innovation and technologies towards achieving the SDGs. Um, we have an urgent uh, four-pronged crisis in front of us, inequality, climate change, pollution, and biodiversity. And we need to find stack solution, not try to address those in silos, but address these together. 
And that's what requires uh, innovation. And none of us can do it alone. We have to partner. We have to work with each other because it's too complex. It's a systems change that we're talking about. And so by working together, I think, to, you know, people like you and your group and public and others, um, and, and together we're going to get there. So I really count on everyone to do their part um, and to reach out to any one of us if, if there's anything that we can do, but also through public and others with whom we work. Thank you. Thank you. That's uh, very inspiring, very helpful. And, and I, I'm going to close by taking a point from uh, one of the panelists saying, Blockchain technology has the ability to connect the unconnected by decentralized communications protocols at much cheaper cost and outreach compared to traditional communication. So that's cross-cutting for all three of you, actually. And, and I want to mention that I used to say that partnerships, which is called 17, is the golden thread. I believe technology remains preeminent in this process. So, Technology, innovation, entrepreneurship, and partnerships are the four golden threads to achieving the SDGs. And I want to thank all of you for joining us. It's been really inspiring. I, I have to tell you, I learned so much and it's with the wealth of information you provided. And we want to have you back again uh, soon. And I want to uh, thank, once again, Public Foundations, our good friend Sergio Fernandez de Cordova, uh, and Stephen Keppel, and I'm going to pass the mic back to Stephen to give the closing comments. Thank you all for being here. Thank, thank you, thank Amir. You. Thanks for your time, and thanks, yeah. everyone. Yeah, thank you all. Thank you, Ursula, Chantaline, Dr. Bin. Um, really great conversation and great insights uh, for the audience here. Um, and Amir, thank you so much for all your support in, in making this uh, great conversation possible. Um, so with that, really just want to uh, close out and say on behalf of Public Foundation, we're grateful to invite you all to this conversation. Um, look all of us up on, on social media, um, public uh, www.public.org for more information about what we do. And we look forward to continuing the conversation. Thank you all so much. Have a great day. Thank you. Thank Bye -bye. you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.